Breaking news tonight, the record death toll inside the United States, more than 1,000 dead in the last 24 hours, the dire warning from the president. This will be probably the toughest week between this week and next week, and there'll be a lot of death. New York with its worst day yet, now predicting the peak to come within days as this convention center takes its first COVID-19 patients. On the front lines, 1,000 ventilators arriving today in New York, but there and across the country, governors and doctors pleading for more desperately needed supplies as pressure grows on the states, holding out from imposing a lockdown. Protecting yourself. The federal government now recommending Americans who live in hot spots to wear face masks. What changed and how you can protect yourself? The cruise ship nightmare coming to an end in Florida today. The startling announcement from the captain. Two of our guests passed away last evening. Many more on board sick. Where do they go now? And there's good news tonight. The moments that unite us. The salute to heroes and the cheers for survivors. This is NBC Nightly News with Jose Diaz Balart. Good evening. We come on the air tonight with a grim milestone. In the last 24 hours, more than 1,000 Americans have died of the coronavirus. That is the largest daily death toll worldwide since the outbreak began. And the projections have those numbers getting even worse. President Trump said today the next two weeks are critical and that he's mobilizing thousands of military personnel to help states. But he also accused many governors of demanding more supplies than they actually need. We have coverage from across the country tonight. And we begin with Kathy Park in the epicenter, New York City. Tonight, New York rushing to mobilize life-saving resources and health care workers for an unprecedented battle against a coronavirus that's far from over. We're not yet at the apex. We're getting closer. We're somewhere in the seven-day range. We're not yet ready for the high point. The epicenter of the nation's outbreak reporting more than 113,000 positive cases and at least 3,500 deaths. New York City alone approaching 70,000 cases and Long Island is catching up. Long Island is the area that is growing. After calls for additional personal protective equipment, beds and medical workers, help is coming. Today, the governor said the state is counting on 85,000 volunteers, plus 1,000 ventilators arriving from China. Oregon is committed to sending 140. We're all in the same battle here. Uh, and the battle is stopping the spread of the virus. On the federal level, President Trump announcing today 1,000 military members are deploying to New York City. Medical support at the USNS Comfort is expanding with peer side screenings where patients will no longer require a negative test. The Javits Center turned temporary hospitals also updating its original plans. Now treating COVID-19 patients. The first group arrived last night. This week, New York City's mayor promoted a national enlistment effort for medical staff. Then I could see us getting these numbers to actually align in real time. And again, when our crisis is over, then moving those folks on to where they're needed most. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, the fight on the front lines is offering a troubling glimpse of the ongoing crisis. They look fine sometimes, but then you look at their vital signs and they don't look fine. And now the virus tightening its grip on first responders. A quarter of all FDNY EMS members are out sick, including this Joe McWilliams. Is, uh, this is a completely different animal for, uh, I would think, anybody, anybody working uh, on the job now. Uh, I, I don't think this, this level has been experienced in, uh, in, 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 my, in my lifetime. Kathy joins us now. Kathy, how much help does New York City still need? Well, Jose, Mayor Bill de Blasio says the city still needs an extra 45,000 medical workers to get them through April and May. So if you can help, you're encouraged to sign up. Jose? Kathy Park in New York City, thank you very much. As the virus spreads, there is growing frustration in some states as they struggle to find the supplies they need. Many say the federal government is just not doing enough. NBC's Aaron McLaughlin has the latest. 
Tonight, as the COVID-19 death toll surpasses 8,000. It's the Wild West out here. States say testing troubles persist. Everything about the tests are very difficult to come by, and there's no federal plan for this. So every state is on their own. And sourcing personal protective equipment is still problematic. We try to buy it. It's really hard. The federal government buys most all of it. We've gotten just 33% of what we've asked for, and they've told us not to expect more anytime soon. This pandemic is a war, and we need the armor to fight it. This is the coronavirus continues to spread across the country, including at sea on board the USS Theodore Roosevelt. In the past 24 hours, the number of confirmed cases jumped to 155. This days after its captain was relieved of duty for sounding the alarm. Emerging hotspots New Jersey, Louisiana and Michigan now seeing a tidal wave of COVID-19. It's like standing on a beach and watching the tsunami come in. Um, so I, I think it's only going to get worse and we're anticipating probably really rough for the next two months. Alabama, the latest to issue a stay-at-home order, with at least seven states yet to issue statewide mandates, including Iowa, where Governor Kim Reynolds is holding out, despite a unanimous vote from her own medical board for urgent action. Now is the time for more urgent action. Uh, what we don't want to do is wait until it's obvious to everybody that we should have had more restrictions in place. The virus does not stop at state borders. And other states, such as Arizona, leaving golf courses open for business. For one state, desperation leading to innovation. In Washington, a new way to recycle and sterilize tens of thousands of medical grade masks. I do think it's a game changer because we can't get these supplies. Their supply chain is very challenging right now. We have N95 masks. This will allow us to use them up to 20 times. In Northern California, proof that a statewide mandate and early action is the difference between life and death. So you think lives have been saved because of the actions of Bay Area's political leaders? There's no question about it. In the city of San Francisco, we have had eight people die. If we had followed the trajectory that they're seeing in New York or New Orleans or Detroit, we would have had hundreds of people die by now. Aaron, the president tonight saying it's up to the states to decide whether there's a statewide mandate. That's right, Jose, but health officials say that states that choose not to implement those mandates put everyone at risk. As infection rates rise, so too does the need for ventilators and masks already in short supply. Jose? Aaron McLaughlin in Los Angeles, thank you. Late today, President Trump had a stark warning that the next two weeks will be the worst yet. He also pushed back on those claims from governors that they're not getting enough supplies. Kelly O'Donnell is at the White House tonight. Kelly. Good evening, Jose. Tonight, amid dire predictions about the expected loss of life over the next week or two, the president used his on-camera briefing late today to revisit the kind of urgency to reopen the country and return to work that he exhibited before he decided to extend the social distancing guidelines through the end of this month. He said difficult decisions will have to be made. And while the states in those hottest spots scramble for supplies and life-saving equipment, the president stressed the federal government is helping with major resources, but he also criticized governors for what he says were inflated requests for equipment beyond the state's actual needs. Everybody has proper intentions, but they want to make sure they're 100 percent. And sometimes when they know they don't need it, they want it anyway. And tonight, President Trump has been a cheerleader for potential therapies like trying medications. You've heard him talk about hydroxychloroquine approved for other illnesses as a possible benefit for coronavirus patients. Tonight, President Trump made a stunning statement that he might even take that drug himself, though he is not ill. Then he added he would check with his doctor. Jose? Kelly O'Donnell at the White House, thank you. In a major shift, the CDC is now recommending that people use some kind of cloth mask when they go outside. NBC's Morgan Chesky looks at how the guidelines have changed. Tonight, with COVID-19 cases on the rise, the CDC now shifting guidelines, calling on everyone to consider covering up. The CDC is advising the use of non-medical cloth face covering as an additional voluntary public health measure. So if this is voluntary. I don't think I'm going to be doing it. The voluntary measure, a turn from early March, when masks were only recommended for the sick or immunocompromised. 
the average American does not need to go out and buy a mask. The new guidance stemming from recent studies showing people without symptoms play a bigger role in spreading COVID-19. New York and L.A., the first to issue citywide guidelines last week. We are afraid for our patients. With doctors still fighting to find medical grade N95 masks, officials are urging people to use non-surgical options. If you can't buy a mask of your own, the CDC says something as simple as a T-shirt or even a bandana can still work. A couple quick folds towards the middle adds a layer of protection. Then slip a rubber band around each end, fold again, and you're set. Even if you don't have any symptoms, wearing this can keep others safe. Nationwide, the homemade mask effort has already taken off. In North Carolina, police are putting their sewing skills to the test to make sure officers are safer when on patrol. We should be, first of all, staying at home and practicing social distancing. And then on top of that, if you need to leave, you absolutely should wear a non-medical grade mask. The newest step of many in the fight against an invisible enemy. Morgan Chesky, NBC News. I want to bring in our medical correspondent on this, Dr. John Torres. Dr. Torres, why did the CDC change its guidance on face masks now? So, Jose, the CDC changed their guidance for a couple of different reasons. One is because now we know that patients that don't have symptoms or are pre-symptomatic can actually spread it. That's 25% of the cases come from those people. And the CDC even says they can spread it simply from talking. And people aren't necessarily following that six-foot guideline, which means they're not staying far enough away. So they're saying, particularly in areas where there's high concentration of cases, or if you have to do things like go to a grocery store where you can't keep that six-foot distance, then masks are important to use, but they want to emphasize they're just one thing you need to use. You still need to use that facial, that six foot distance, because it's important for all of us to stay safe that way. And wash your hands over and over again, Dr. Torres. Thank you very much. Hey. Still ahead tonight, the new cruise ship nightmare. Two dying on board, others sick with the coronavirus. Where do they go now? And throughout the program tonight, we're going to spotlight the moments that unite us, like this standing ovation for healthcare workers by another set of heroes, members of the New York City Fire Department. Just imagine being trapped for days on a cruise ship as a deadly outbreak of the virus spreads. The latest nightmare was on a ship that finally docked today in Miami with two dead and at least 11 others with COVID-19 symptoms. NBC Sam Brock is there tonight. Tonight, news of another tragedy striking at sea. Two of our guests passed away last evening while being treated in the medical center. That recording comes from Peter and Grace Nam, two of the 1900 on board. Their son, Paul, telling us he learned his dad tested positive for COVID-19 and didn't know for weeks when his parents would make it to port. They got sick about two weeks ago. They were having symptoms of cold, Fever, absolute nightmare. This afternoon, that nightmare finally ended when the Coral Princess pulled into Miami with passengers carried out on stretchers. The ship's parent company, Princess Cruises, sang it's deeply saddened by the deaths and that guests requiring shoreside medical care will be prioritized to disembark first. Just two days early, two Holland America ships carrying 1,200 passengers, four dead and dozens sick, docked 30 miles away. Those passengers, like Laura Gabaroni and Juan Huergo, launched on a South American voyage at a time only a handful of coronavirus cases were confirmed on that continent. It seemed like the only safe place to actually take a vacation in the whole world. Um, and our own government that day was telling us that it was safe to travel and, and safe to live your life normally. After four weeks of uncertainty, the couple reunited with their son Thursday night, something Paul Nam and other Coral Princess families also want. Sad, angry. There were times where we were happy to know that they were okay on the ship, but once we got the positive test result, it's, it's been heartbreaking. Sam joins us now from the Port of Miami. Sam, where are the rest of the passengers going? Yeah, Jose, first, everybody's got to go through a health screening. We just heard some applause behind me as some of the 60 Floridians are being driven home right now. Then another 330 passengers are going on domestic flights and about 604 nationals on chartered planes. Jose? 
Sam Brock in Miami, thank you. Not of the financial emergency. And if you're the owner of a small business who needs one of those government loans to stay open, you may already be feeling frustrated by the application process. Stephanie Rule has that story. New York City entrepreneur Nick Ponto thought he had found the lifeline his small business needed, a new federal program aimed at saving jobs. But after having issues even applying, he was devastated. It felt like the world's largest bait and switch. And it felt like, you know, we've been a responsible small business. The growing frustration from Nick and other small business owners comes during the rollout of the Paycheck Protection Program, which is intended to provide an incentive for small businesses to pay their employees during the COVID-19 crisis. The federal government has authorized $350 billion in forgivable loans to businesses with fewer than 500 employees and will cover their costs for at least eight weeks. I encourage all small businesses that have 500 or fewer people, please contact your lenders. You get the money, you'll get it the same day. You use this to pay your workers. Please bring your workers back to work. Tonight, the biggest banks have live applications offering relief to the 35 million small businesses in America. Yesterday, Bank of America received over 85,000 applications for over $22 billion in assistance. That surge causing problems for small business owners like Nick. The paycheck program that everyone's saying is going to help small business, we're being denied and there's no way for us to access that fund. And it's terrifying. As of tonight, the top three lenders are telling me that technical issues are causing a delay in the application process, but all parties are working together to get things moving. Jose? Stephanie Rule, thank you very much. Coming up, the $1 billion vaccine moonshot will take you inside one major effort to battle the coronavirus. And this moment that unites us. After a Memphis pastor died from coronavirus complications, his church choir showed up at his house to comfort his wife with song. And now to the urgent race to develop a vaccine against the coronavirus. Tonight, we want to take you inside one major effort to create a vaccine. Scientists hoping to start production even before it's approved. Here's Ann Thompson. Are its distinctive spikes the key to a vaccine for the coronavirus? A joint project by the federal government and Johnson & Johnson is betting a billion dollars it is. We've got a candidate that has a high degree of probability of being successful against the COVID-19 virus. Dr. Dan Baruch helped develop the potential vaccine in his Boston lab. Using a disabled common cold virus proven safe in work on vaccines for Zika, HIV and Ebola, scientists insert one of the coronavirus spikes and then inject it. The spike protein is uh, synthesized and the body makes an immune response to it. And that is the vaccine. Successfully tested on animals, human trials will start in September. What we need is uh, to make vaccines uh, for a billion people and we need to make that as quickly as possible. The race to create a vaccine took off January 10th when Chinese scientists released the virus's genetic sequence, a series of letters revealing the blueprint used by researchers all over the world to design more than 50 vaccine candidates. January 10th, uh, around 11 p.m., that's when we started. Long before many governments paid attention. To meet anticipated demand, J&J &J says it will produce its not-for-profit vaccine even before approval. Early next year, we'll be able to start delivering vaccines from our manufacturing plant. Dramatically shrinking development time from five to seven years to just 12 to 18 months. Dr. Bruce Gellin is a global vaccine expert. Can we trust a vaccine that has been fast-tracked? That's, that's the most important question. And I think what's important for people to understand is that we can, we can go fast, but we can't, we can't cut corners and we're not gonna cut corners. We can follow, follow all the guidelines, but by doing them in parallel and not in sequence, we can shorten those timelines. So the cure is not worse than the illness. Ann Thompson, NBC News, New York. And coming up, there's good news tonight. The other frontline workers, the ones caring for the animals, and this moment that unites us. A coronavirus survivor discharged from an Austin, Texas hospital and the medical staff who turned out to send her off.
there's good news tonight about another kind of essential worker during these trying times. Kristen Dahlgren tonight on the people looking after the animals. In what would normally be one of the busiest weeks at Missouri's Dickerson Zoo. And to look around and nobody is here, it's heartbreaking. Nobody here to see the handful of selfless zookeepers who come every day to make sure the animals get food and critical care. We're going to get through this. Oh, yeah. It's going to end and we're still going to be here. It's the same at the Columbus Zoo, where workers now do their jobs completely isolated. No two allowed in the same room. It means everything to come in and see this team pull together and really put themselves at risk to come in every day. Keepers at hundreds of zoos and aquariums across the country who say there's no other choice. <coughs> Even in New York, where the infection rate continues to skyrocket, Essential personnel are putting aside their own fears to show up every day at the Bronx Zoo. They are putting themselves in a bit of a vulnerable position, but they have to because they feel that responsibility to the animals. And while Americans are being told to socially distance, for many animals, connection is critical. Back in Missouri, the zoo animals now have pen pals. It says, Dear Alpacas, I love you guys so much. Because Kids writing letters, the staff can read to the animals. Dear Sloths. The love not lost because of a little social distance. I wanted to write to a few different animals to see how they're doing. Kristen Dahlgren, NBC News, New York. What extraordinary people. That's NBC Nightly News for this Saturday. I'm Jose diaz Balart reporting. Thank you for the privilege of your time. And please stay safe. Good night. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.